So number four then from this specimen paper, here we go, four marks for the Euclidean algorithm and also solving this little Diophantine equation, meaning an equation we're only considering integer roots. Well, first of all, it works it slightly different, it says, show that the greatest common divisor of these two numbers, that's the notation for it, we don't use that, is one. So you already know the answer to this. Now the way the marks are split are there's two marks for this part and two marks for this part. Now this part, the way it would start would be this. You start off with 729, and the first thing you test is, does that divide exactly into it? Divide into it, and if it goes in exactly, that means obviously that is the greatest number that divides into them both. Now when you divide it into it, it only goes in one time. I prefer to have that at the front because that's the way I saw it a long time ago in a number theory book. You can put it at the end the same way as you see in the marking scheme if you like. But there are benefits to having it at the front. But unfortunately there's a remainder. That remainder is 242. Now putting that first line down, that's the basic step in this algorithm. Putting that down gets the first mark. In other words, dividing it in and seeing what the remainder is. Again, if the remainder was zero, that'd be the greatest common divisor. But the way this algorithm works is this. Whatever number it is, that's the biggest number that goes into both of these. If it divides into both of these, since both sides are equal, then it must also divide into both of these. Which means what you can do now is take another step and test these two instead of those two. So you start again with these two. And again, as far as this is concerned, that multiples of no interest to you just now. The greatest common divisor must divide these two numbers. So, 487, 242. Does that divide into that? Because if it does, that'll be the greatest divisor. Well, you can get two of them this time, but you still got a remainder of three. So the same process applies. Whatever the biggest number that divided into those two was, We'll also divide into them, so that's narrowed it down. You're down to just three now, so this answer is three or less. And you start again with these two. Not interested in that. So, two, four, two. That's one advantage of having that at the front, because it's just these two here that I want. Now, this time it's 80 of them. Don't let that 80 catch your eye instead. That 80 is just the multiple, which is of no interest to you just now. With two left over, now you already know the answer because you look at 3 and 2. What's the biggest number that goes into 3 and 2? Obvious one. But I'll carry on. 3 then is equal to just 1 times 2 plus 1. So obviously that must be the answer because I can't get any lower than 1. If you carried it on for one more line though, taking them across, 3, oops, 2 equals, well that would be 2 times 1 plus 0. Now as soon as you get the 0, that means it divided in exactly. So that was the answer. But notice the answer is this last number you reached before the remainder was zero. So that's the greatest common divisor. So you could write, just use those letters, greatest common divisor equals one. Meaning that the biggest number that we go into both of them is one. So in other words, they've got no factors in common. Incidentally, that means those numbers are called co-prime. Numbers that have got no factors in common. And getting that, or pursuing that, gets you the second mark. Now, for this part, you're simply going to gather that back up, heading towards the 729, because in doing that, you'll gather up all the 487s and 729s that would have been there. And again, I think that's why it's handy to have these multiples, which you didn't, weren't actually interested in, in getting to this, at the front, because it's better to multiply a bracket from the front rather than the back. And the way it works is this, you start with the 1. So 1 was actually equal to this, minus that. So that's equal to 3 minus 1 times. Now you step up to the 2. 2 is equal to this, minus that. Now you tidy that up, so now we've got numbers of 2, 4, 2 and 3. Take away a negative, that's plus 80. And there's one of them here already, so I've got 81 lots of 3 minus, and I'll just put in that, one lot of 2, 4, 2. Now you can step up to the 3. So I've got 81 lots of, what's the 3 equal to? 4, 8, 7 minus 2 lots of 2, 4, 2 minus, the second part now, 
the one lot that you had of 242. Quite tedious. But at this point, once you've gone through that step back twice, it says, you get a mark. More or less just because there's two marks for this side, so they get the first mark halfway through it. But now we can gather up the 242s and the 487s. Well, there's 81 lots of 487. That's not a very good eight. But that's going to be minus 162, minus 163 lots of the 242. And then we're up at the top here, I can replace that 242. So I've got 81 lots of the 487 and 163 lots of 247 is equal to, reading it across, 729 minus one of them, one of 487. So altogether you've got for the 487s, that's plus 163. So that'll be 244. Lots of 487 minus the 163 lots of 729. And there you are. That's the answer then. So what was X and Y? I can compare it to this. That means that the X was the multiple of this, which is 244. Whoops. And the Y, but notice it's got plus Y times it. So the Y is going to be negative 163. And that gives you the last mark. And of course, one thing you do when you go through this to this line here, because there was all these wee bits of arithmetic, is you quickly put that in your calculator and check that that comes to one. And if it doesn't, you just have to go back and find a mistake.